obviously a new format. Uh, so hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, I hope you can all see and hear me clearly. Uh, this makes a bit of a difference to doing a talk in person. Uh, as I was saying before, the, the tea and the biscuits are, are unfortunately you have to provide your own, uh, but we don't need to ask people about reusable mugs. Um, I hope you can all um, sit down with us and enjoy the next um, sort of hopefully 45 minutes or so of talk. We've got some time for questions afterwards. Um, there's a chat channel uh, below the video. Um, you should be able to ask any questions you have uh, at any point in there. And if you if you ask any questions during the talk, um, they'll obviously be recorded, and I can then read them all at the end and uh, hopefully answer them. And if I miss any, Stephen is moderating for me, so he can pick up any questions that I miss and let me know what's happening. Um, so my talk tonight is all about um, making bees. Um, uh, we often talk about making honey. Uh, it's one of the big things beekeepers talk about. Uh, so I thought I'd give a talk entitled Making Bees. It's basically the, the, the other side of what we end up doing, which is to try and increase our colonies, increase our stocks, and improve our bees. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, everything from the absolute basics for beginners on how you get your first bees, right through to more advanced topics on uh, queen rearing and on bee breeding a little bit, um, and just really give you all an idea about uh, what you can achieve if you need to increase your stocks. For the introduction, there's really three questions. How do you get bees? Once you've got bees, how do you get more bees? And then what do you do with all those bees? And those are basically the three questions that I'm hoping to answer in my talk tonight. And we should be able to, to give you some answers to those. Um, as most of you will have experienced uh, when you first became a beekeeper, the most common way that you, you get bees is to buy bees. And the most common way to buy bees is in a five frame nucleus. Uh, five frame nucleus obviously gives you a, a good um, a good option um, because it's a it's a cheap, easy, accessible um, way to to get access to bees. Um, ideally, a nucleus should be a minimum of four seams of bees, uh, three frames of brood, and one or more frames of stores and pollen. You really want to be maximising on uh, the amount of bees and brood you have in there because <clears throat> you want to get, basically get your money's worth. If you're not getting that, then um, you're probably not getting a good quality nuke, especially if you're buying it later in the year. It'll take some time to build up. And it's very important to think about you know, what the characteristics are of the bees in that nuke. Ideally, you'll get to visit them and see them in advance. You'll get to inspect them. You really want a, this year's queen, or if it's overwintered, last year's queen. You don't want a queen that's three or four years old, where this is going to be her last year. You really want the frames to be quite good quality, relatively new. Obviously, if it's overwintered, they're going to be last year or maybe the year before, but you don't want five-year-old dark black frames with holes in them and lots of patchy old drone brood and things. You want to obviously have no sign of disease, and you want them to be happy and healthy looking so that they'll build up strongly for you and you'll, you'll get your money's worth. You can obviously also buy bees in, in a full hive instead of in a nuke. Uh, most people buy nukes because they're cheaper, and unless you really need to push and get honey in your first year, Buying a nuke is an easy option and it's the best way to get built up easily and cheaply. Um, obviously, people do sell hives. They tend to sell them more at the start of the year. Um, so if you really need to get going early, then a, a hive is a good option. But for most people, buying a nuke is the, the easiest way into beekeeping. Now, the downside to buying a nuke, obviously, is that it costs some money. So the alternative option is to think about swarms. And there are two ways to go about getting hold of swarms. Um, there's the passive way, which is to set up bait hives, or the more, pro more proactive way, which is to go out and actually hunt for them, look for swarm calls and look out for people having problems with swarms. Bait hives are really easy to set up. You really just need an empty box of about the right capacity, um, ideally with um, a couple of old frames in it, um, preferably ones that have some, some wax on them, but even a completely empty box that has nothing to do with beekeeping works quite well. And you just need to position it somewhere where the bees can find it, get into it. Higher up off the ground is helpful. Having a solid floor is helpful. Having reduced entrance is helpful. But really, there's no real guarantee on what bees will and won't like. So if you've got any beekeeping equipment, especially if you're a beginner, you've bought your hives, you're getting ready to set up for the year, and you haven't got a nuke yet, don't leave it packed away in your garage. Set it up on a stand in a final location. And you may just find that a swarm will find it and move in without having to do anything. In terms of collecting swarms for more experienced beekeepers, um, Ember has a swarm collection 
uh, process, which basically I coordinate. So if anyone in Edinburgh discovers a swarm, they phone me, hopefully don't phone the police who then phone me, um, and I then farm those out to local beekeepers. So if you're a beekeeper in Edinburgh and you want to get on the swarm collection register, drop me an email after the talk and providing you, you have some experience of beekeeping and you've got somewhere to put them afterwards, I can add you to the list. So if swarms are an option, they're obviously cheaper than buying bees. The biggest downside to swarms is you don't know anything about the bees you're getting. They've just turned up, probably from a neighbour, but you don't really know where if you've gone to collect them somewhere far from where you live. You don't know what their history is, you don't know what the genetics or their temper or anything like that is like, and most importantly you don't know what diseases they might be carrying. So be aware that if you're bringing a swarm from a collection or from a bait hive, try and keep it somewhere quarantined for probably a week or two, just so you can look for any signs of disease. Look for particularly the fowl broods in any new eggs and larvae that are developing. European fowl brood is easy to spot in the larval stage in fresh comb that's being built. You also want to look at varroa on them and potentially also deal with any varroa treatments before you move them into your main apiary where they may cause problems for your, your other bees. So once you've got your colony of bees and they're building up nicely, an easy way to make more bees is basically to end up making a nuke. So making a nuke is a really simple process. You just take an empty nuke box, you go to your colony, which is hopefully building up nicely, and you take two to three frames of open brood and bees, making sure you don't have the queen with, a couple of frames with stores, pollen, undrawn foundation, and then you close it up and put it somewhere relatively far away from your original colony so that not too many bees drift back to the original box and you wait and hopefully what will happen is that the bees in that box will realize that they're queenless they'll panic they'll start building emergency queen cells from the open brood and this is why having some open brood in there is important having capped brood is also useful because then you'll have more bees to to appear and become nurse bees shortly after that but they'll soon enough start drawing queen and if you're lucky one of those queen cells will emerge and get out and get mated there's a slight downside however to making up your own nukes in this way is that you don't always get the best quality queens and there are two reasons for this the first is that queens built in the emergency response that is bees suddenly finding themselves queenless can sometimes be lower quality than bees which are planning queens such as when they're swarming or superseding and this is because they basically are in a bit of a rush to get a new queen and they don't always have the best choice of eggs and larvae to choose from so you might not get the strongest queen because they might not basically put as much work into it as they would if they were doing swarming or superseding the second reason is that raising a queen takes a reasonable amount of energy and if the bees are quite depleted of numbers, if, the, if you haven't put that many bees into the box, if they're quite low on stores or if they're low on pollen, they can't actually make that good quality a queen. So it's important that if you are thinking about making up a nuke like this and you expect them to raise good quality queens, that they have plenty of stores, ideally some pollen and a good number of bees in there or plenty of capped brood that will emerge so that any queens that they do raise they can do a good job of basically bringing um, to be nice strong queens. So assuming you've got a strong colony and you haven't taken any nukes out of it and it's building up, the day will come, usually about now onwards in the year, from sort of the end of April, beginning of May, when those colonies will think about swarming. So you should be doing your seven day inspections and making sure that any swarms or any swarm preparations are being accounted for. You should be looking out for queen cells, typically on the bottom of the frame. You can hopefully see in this picture an example there of um, what the what queen cells on the bottom of a frame look like typically in swarming as opposed to emergency or supersedure cells. You must have spare equipment on standby. This is the most important thing that every beekeeper will tell you that at some point in your beekeeping year you will run out of the right number of boxes or frames or roofs or floors just when you need it. And when you've got swarms happening you're often in a very tight window. In that seven day inspection you might only be 24 hours away from the swarm happening and if you don't do something about it straight away then the chances are you'll miss it. So have plenty of spare equipment on standby, practice wherever you can and just make sure that you know exactly what you're doing. Because if you haven't practiced it, especially with some of the different techniques, if you get confused and do it wrong, you might end up losing the swarm anyway. So make sure with your swarming that you practice and have everything standing by and have everything ready. It's not complicated and once you've done it a few times it becomes really easy, but it's important to do it ASAP as soon as you can and get it done so that the bees don't swarm and you don't lose any bees. Because obviously we're talking about increase here, not about decrease. So a common method, probably the commonest one that people get taught, is the Pagden method. Um, 
technically this is the hidden method, but um, we'll, we'll call it Pagden method because that's what most people know it as. And this is maybe the simplest one. I'll just very briefly run through it. Hopefully you all know it already. And that is you've got an existing box which has a queen, queen cells, really busy, looks like it's going to swarm. You move that box slightly to one side, you put a new box with empty foundation or undrawn combs, and you move the queen without any queen cells back into that box, and then you close them all up. And the idea is that the flying bees will return to the original site and take care of the queen. The queen will start laying in the new frames, and there won't be any swarming instinct because they're not overcrowded and there isn't a lot of brood and a lot of young bees to encourage swarming. The old box, which is now queenless, will bring on the queen cells, and eventually a new queen will emerge, and you've now got basically two for the price of one. The extra step in here, which is in this diagram, is the hidden step, which is after seven days to move the box with the um, the old box with the queenless half to the other side of the queen right box. The idea here is that the bees that have turned from nurse bees into flying bees will now drift into the box with the queen in it. This is because the queen doesn't have a lot of bees looking after her and they're older flying bees and their population's dying off. So you want to boost them slightly by having bees drift in. And after about 21 days, a new queen should have emerged and you should basically be ready for um, her to go out on her mating flights and be ready to basically bring you in some, some brand new bees. So the important question here, really, is why stop at two? So when you do that split, you go from one box to two boxes. But actually, there's no reason to stop at just two. There are two limiting factors when you do a split. One is the number of queen cells that you have, and the other one is the total amount of bees that you have, bees and brood and frames. Uh, the image shown here is one from a, s a setup devised by Vince Cook, which is called the circle split. And the idea in this is he's making a huge amount of increase all in one go. So he would build up an extremely strong colony till it was absolutely rammed to the gunnels with bees, wait for them to start swarm preparations. As soon as they start swarm preparations, every single frame, every single bee is taken out and divided up between a number of nuke boxes. Now he was working in New Zealand and I think he's got eight to ten boxes in his setup. We might find with, with national hives in a single brood box maybe four or five might be a more reasonable number. And you set them up in a circle around the site of the original hive which you've now taken away because all the frames have gone to the nuke boxes. All the flying bees will return to that spot and they'll drift into a nuke more or less at random and gradually over the course of a 24 hours all of the nukes will evenly have bees distributed between them or if there's a bit of a prevailing wind and they tend to drift into one, you can swap the nuke boxes around for a couple of days until they're all evenly balanced. Now every single nuke box has a small package of bees, brood, and importantly, at least one queen cell. That queen can emerge and get mated and come out, and then you basically have a new nuke. And this is a really easy way to go from having a strong colony into having lots of nukes if you need to increase very rapidly. One of the important things to note is that when you do this, the original queen mustn't end up in one of those nuke boxes because she'll still be producing pheromone and that pheromone will draw bees to that nuke box. So all the flying bees will smell her and fly back to that one nuke box and the other nuke boxes will be depleted of bees. But it's a very effective technique. Um, three, four, even five nuke boxes is possible, especially if you have a double, double hive set up. So it's an easy way to rapidly increase, especially if you've had some, some winter losses and you really need to get back on track and increase the number of colonies that you have. Now, as a slight aside, the title of this talk obviously is Making Bees, um, and this slide is Making More Bees, because so far we've really been talking about increase from a beekeeper's perspective, which is getting more colonies. But actually, there's a second part to making more bees, and that is to have more bees in the actual hives that you're planning to split and increase from. So obviously the more you split, if you look at Vince Cook's circle split, you need a big colony to start with in order to get all those frames and all those bees in order to, to make lots and lots of nukes. So if you want to build up a colony to do this kind of split, there are several things that you're going to need. You need plenty of space to expand, and this is obviously room for the queen to get into and to lay to produce lots of brood. And for that you're going to need a young queen, because a young queen will lay quite heavily and quite quickly so it's important that you basically have a young queen doing that. And once you've got the young queen laying, then you need plenty of nurse bees, which she should be producing, in order to look after all the eggs and larvae that she's laying. 
To make eggs and larvae, they need a good nutritional supply, predominantly pollen, because eggs and larvae are all protein, and protein comes from the pollen that the bees are consuming. So again, if it's a poor summer or a poor spring, and there isn't much forage around, you may need to feed either one-to-one -one syrup to give them the energy to do this, or pollen in order to um, produce the actual, uh, both the brood and the royal jelly and the, the protein that they're going to be fed on. Obviously it goes without saying, you're doing this with a nice, strong, healthy, disease-free colony. You don't want to be trying to do this with a weak, sickly colony that isn't going to thrive and build up. And you also need good quality, fresh, relatively new frames. The reason for this is twofold. Firstly, older frames are more likely to carry disease and to carry problems like chalk brood or Nesema or foul brood. Hopefully you won't have that. Um, so diseased frames, old frames, aren't going to be as good quality in that regard. The second reason, more importantly, is that old frames tend to have lots more drone brood in them, they tend to have um, lots more holes in them, lots more space that isn't being available for the queen to lay in. So if you actually have holes in all your frames, you might only get 80 or 90% of the brood that you would get if all the frames were new and went corner to corner and the queen was laying in a nice brood pattern. Finally, if you're making more bees because you want to make lots of nukes and you want to then sell those nukes on to beginners, no beginner wants to buy a nuke from you if it's got five-year-old manky frames with lots of drone brood and holes and chalk brood and goodness knows what else in it. So if you are making more bees, good quality frames is really important. But having a nice, strong, well-looked-after, well-fed colony is also really critical. So the next stage up from this, the next advancement, is to look at queen rearing. So queen rearing basically gives you one or two major advantages over letting this happen around swarm season. The main ones being that you're not reliant on swarming. You can do this more or less any point in the year when there are drones around for queens to mate with. You can do differences between the donor and the raiser colonies. So in, in queen rearing, a donor colony is the colony providing the eggs and larvae that will become the queens. And raiser colonies will be the colonies that actually take care of and look after the, the queen cells until they eventually hatch and go out to be mated. So these can be different. And this is very important because you may find that in your apiary you have a very strong colony that builds up really strongly, but they've got some other traits that you don't particularly like. And you've got another colony that builds up quite slowly, and you really like the traits and you want to breed from them, but they never swarm and they never produce queen cells. So because they never swarm, that's a great uh, trait for them to have as far as you're concerned, because you're not worried about them swarming. But because they're never swarming, you can't basically get the queen cells that you need. So being able to, to mix and match between donor and raiser colonies is really important. And finally, if you're doing things on a larger scale, then you get a, an ability to do quite a lot of sort of mass production with queen rearing um, that you don't get by just doing simple splits. There are a wide variety of different ways to actually get the bees to make queen cells. Um, there are four of them shown here. Uh, the first one, the top left picture, the frame with the holes in it, uh, this is known as the Miller method, but there are variations like the Alley method, um, which all work in the same principle, and that is to modify an existing frame in a way to encourage bees to draw queen cells. So in the Miller method, you usually cut out a hole or cut out triangles in the frame, leaving the eggs intact. Because the eggs are now on the edge of an open space below them, the bees will be more likely to draw queen cells down. The next picture to the right is a Nico cup kit. There's Nico or Gento or a few other manufacturers of these. And these are special devices. You put the queen in, they have little plastic cups that simulate the wax cells. The queen lays in those instead of into a, into a normal frame. And then you can take those cups and hang them vertically and allow the bees to draw queen cells from them. The bottom left picture is a cell punch. And this is basically a similar idea. You're using a small a sharp ring to cut a cell with an egg in it or with larvae in it out of a frame and again you can hang that vertically. The final picture shows grafting, same idea, in fact the cups used here are cups from a Genta cup kit. Um, you're using a small tool like a little spatula or a paintbrush to lift larvae out of a cell and then drop it into one of these cups very gently and then hang that vertically. There's a huge variety of ways to do it, so you don't need to worry too much about, um, everyone gets a bit hung up about grafting, about how it might be quite difficult, and you do need good eyesight and a steady hand to do it. But the other options mean that there are many, many ways of doing this that don't rely on you being able to see the larvae and being able to do the grafting. So you could start with one or more of these techniques and play around and see which one you like if you fancy a go at making queen cells. Now obviously once you've got all these little larvae and ready to hang vertically, you need to convince the bees that they want to draw them into queen cells. And the problem is that 
there isn't really an incentive for the bees to draw lots of queen cells in a hive that has a healthy queen. <clears throat> so what you have to do is encourage them to draw queen cells. And one of the simplest ways of doing this is to make the hive queenless. So what people often do is they take a nice strong hive, take the queen, put her and a few bees in a nuke off to one side, keeping her happy and healthy, but just out of the way. Then they'll put this frame of larvae in after maybe 24 hours when the bees are queenless and presented with the opportunity to suddenly build queen cells and presented with a whole load of vertical hanging cups is the prime site for them to start building queen cells. Now the downside to doing it with a queenless colony is that you have to look after that queen when you put her somewhere else and because she's in a nuke box with only a small number of bees she's likely to slow down so she's going to go a little bit off the lay she won't be producing as many bees and the colony will have a slight uh, interruption in its build-up. So if you then go back to the colony once it's drawn queen cells and take the queen cells away and put the queen back in again, you'll have had a couple of weeks where the, the population will have a slight dip. And if this is a colony where you really want to be bringing in a strong honey flow later in the year and you've got the timings just wrong, then you might find you've got fewer bees at the time of honey production than you might otherwise want. So queenless um, queen rearing uh, is very useful and very productive. And if you have a very strong colony, it can be very effective but on a small scale isn't always ideal if you also want to use the colony for other things like honey production. So the method which I prefer, um, the one I use most of the time, is a queen right method called the Ben-Harden method. And the Ben-Harden method is basically um, set up so that you can do it in an existing colony, ideally one that is quite small, it doesn't have to be super, super strong. So it's ideal for both the Scottish climate, where we get a late start to the year. And it's also very good for native bees or local bees that might not build up quite so strongly as maybe Italian or hybrid bees might do. It's also a queen right method, so it doesn't interrupt the colony's own build up. You can keep the supers on, you can keep the colony working as normal, um, and the bees don't really notice the extra work they're putting into raising queens. So in this setup, you take a standard hive, you put a queen excluder on top of the brood box with the queen below, and this is just to keep her away from the queen cells, because obviously if she's wandering around and finds queen cells, she's not going to be too happy about that and is going to want to destroy them. Above that, you put a second brood box, and in that second brood box, you put the frame with the queen cells in the middle, you put a frame of young brood, open brood, next to it, and that's to draw nurse bees up to look after the young brood and by doing so also those queen cells otherwise if you just put the queen cells in they might not notice them and by the time they do they might not be in fit condition to keep raising queens you put a frame of pollen on both sides maximize the pollen maximize the queen cell production and then you pad out the rest of that box with dummy frames these are often insulated frames they can be made quite easily out of old bits of kingspan um, or bits of plywood old frames kind of nailed together and the idea behind this is to keep that centre part of the colony quite warm and quite small so that you don't need a huge number of bees to come upstairs from downstairs in a relatively small colony. If you didn't have the dummy frames in there, you'd need a much stronger colony to keep the upstairs kind of warm enough and populated with enough bees to, to raise queen cells. So you're really concentrating all the effort onto the queen cells in that box. The queen downstairs will be more than happy. She won't mind this. Um, the only important thing is you obviously have to take the queen cells out before they emerge. If the queens emerge in the top box, the first queen to emerge is probably going to destroy all the others, undoing all your hard work. And then she's going to release lots of pheromone, which is going to upset the queen in the bottom box. And the bees may end up deciding to swarm, or they may decide they don't like, like the new queen and they might ball her. So you do have to watch out that you get to the queen cells in time. Saying that, the Ben Harden method is very effective. It's a method I've used for a number of years to raise queens. It's recommended by the National Bee Unit. Um, it's the method that they used when they ran their um, research apiaries for many, many years. Um, and it's predominantly a very, very easy setup, one that you don't need to worry about too much. And you don't need a lot of extra equipment, a lot of extra time. You don't need super strong colonies. So it's one I can definitely recommend. Now you've got all these queen cells and you were planning to put them into nukes, but actually a cell bar frame that you've grafted or taken cups onto, um, you can potentially raise uh, up to 20 cells easily in the Ben Harden method. So now you've got 20 queen cells, but you're probably not going to have the resource to make 20 nukes. If you think about what we said at the beginning, if you want a healthy nuke, you ideally want to have two to three seams of bees, and you want to basically have um, 
everything set up so that um, they've got plenty of stores and plenty of resources. And then having done that, you want to basically create a lot of them. And if you've say got 20 queen cells that you want to use, you want to have 20 nukes, well, you're really talking about having 40 or 50 frames of brood. And I know most people, including myself, can't really spare 50 frames of brood plus another however knows who knows how many frames of pollen and, and stores and drawn comb and all these other things. So trying to make 20 colonies is going to be a major hassle. You're going to have major problems getting to that point. So what do people do on a large scale? Because obviously they can't throw thousands and thousands of frames at things if you're a commercial bee breeder. Well, people use mini nukes. And a mini nuke is exactly the same idea as a main nuke. It's just much, much smaller. They're generally always made out of polystyrene. Uh, the image on the left, the apodea, the brown mini nuke, um, this is one of the, the earliest uh, designs of polystyrene ones, and it's the sort of de facto best one, but it's also possibly the most expensive. Uh, the one on the right, I think, is a keeler, or it's one of the Chinese ones. They're much, much cheaper. They all work in the same way. You fill them with a cupful. Literally, you take a, a cup or a scoop. Um, about 300 mils of bees is about 1,000 bees. Um, nurse bees, which you've usually collected from um, either brood frames or from a super, which is mostly nurse bees, um, and you tip a cupful of them in, sprayed with water to stop them flying away again. You have some fondant in the little feed hole at the back, and you can see a little tray of fondant somebody's dropped in there. And then you close them up, you leave them for a very short period of time, and then you add either a queen cell or a virgin queen. You close the whole thing up, you leave it in a cool dark place for a few days, and they form together into a little mini colony. Then you take them out to your apiary, you open the front door, you let the queen, who hopefully over this stage, if the queen cell has emerged or a virgin queen is ready to fly, she flies out, she gets mated, she comes back and she starts laying. The bees in the meantime have drawn lots of little bits of wax and you can see that in the picture on the right. And you come back and inspect and you look for signs of laying. As soon as you see the queen laying eggs in there, then the most important thing you have to do is lock the door. So the front doors on these all have some kind of queen excluder. The reason for that is as soon as they have a laying queen, these bees are going to swarm because as far as they're concerned, they're massively overcrowded in a tiny, very unsuitable space. So if you have a mated queen, if you left them in there for a few days of her laying, they'd soon decide they were going to swarm. They would start building queen cells and they would swarm or abscond. So as soon as that happens, you can basically lock the door into queen excluder mode so the queen can't leave, they can't swarm with her. And then you can take that queen out, cage her up, and reuse her somewhere else in another colony or in a nuke. And this goes back to what we were basically talking about at the very beginning. Say you've done like a circle split. You've got a whole load of nukes set up, but you haven't got enough queen cells. What you can now do is not do that at the beginning. You can wait until you've got all your mini nukes made up. You can wait until you've got a known number of queens. And once you know how many queens you've got, you can then make up the number of nukes to order add a queen to each one, caged, they'll release her after a couple of days, and everything will be good to go. The only other important thing with mini-nukes is if they're tiny, they can overheat very easily. So if you are using mini-nukes, make sure to put them in a corner of an apiary where it's a little bit shady. Normally we don't think putting hives in shade, but mini-nukes, they can't keep them cool, so they have to basically be put out of the way, otherwise the heat causes them to abscond. They just don't like being in a hot environment. The other important thing with mini nukes is that we've got to this point where we've talked about queen rearing and grafting and bringing on lot of frames, a frame of queen cells, and we're thinking about this as quite relatively high production now. But actually, this goes all the way back to the very early stages where we talked about simple artificial swarming. If you've got some mini nukes with some fondant in, just sitting on a shelf in your apiary, sitting in a cupboard somewhere, when you find a colony that you like that's swarming, generally, if you're even if you're doing a simple, simple, simple split into two different colonies, you'll have bucket loads of queen cells because swarms always like to bring on at least 10 to 20 queen cells. So at that point, when you're doing your Pagden split or your Demare or whatever method you choose, you've got the option to just get a pen knife, carefully cut some queen cells out and put a couple into some apodeas and set them up in the same way with a cup full of bees from the same colony. The advantage of this is that when you've done your split, as you sometimes find, one half of your split doesn't take. The old queen doesn't really survive, or the new queen doesn't get mated. If you've done this with the spare queen cells, you've got a couple of spare um, apodeas with mated queens in. If anything happens to your main plan split, you've got spare queens. So you've always got to back up to the process. And it's an extra 10 minutes to basically open the lid, drop in a cup of bees, 
carefully lower the queen cell in, close it up, and then three or four days later, open the door again. That's all the extra effort that's involved, and potentially you could be getting several more queens out of the process. So now, as I said at the beginning, what do you do with all those bees? And maybe you now have an overabundance of bees in your apiary. Maybe you've got too many, and you're not quite sure what you're going to end up doing with them. So if you've got too many bees, you've probably got one of three situations. The first one is you've got too many nukes. And if you have too many nukes, well, obviously you can sell them. And we talked at the beginning about how beginners coming into beekeeping are always looking to buy nukes. And established beekeepers who've had losses of nukes over winter um, will be looking to buy as well. And they'll probably want to buy nukes because that's the cheap and easy option. If you've overwintered a nuke, um, it gives you back up to replace your own winter losses. But overwintered nukes are also quite a premium commodity because people generally get to look in their hives for the first time in March or April. They've discovered that their bees, for some reason, haven't survived, and they're really desperate to keep beekeeping. But if people aren't raising new queens and doing splits and artificial swarming until middle of May, they've basically got to wait six weeks, eight weeks, until they'll be able to get hold of a new, a new colony. So people are really desperate to get hold of bees early on in the season so they can make a good start of it, especially established beekeepers. So having a nuke that you've taken through winter to look after your own bees in case you have any losses, any that are left over from that, if all your colonies have done well, are a really valuable commodity and you can always find buyers for them. The second option, if you're queen rearing and you have too many queens, well, the first thing you can do with them is you can choose to replace any aging, failing or poor quality queens in your own apiary. If you've raised a whole load of new young queens and you've got some hives that just haven't been doing very well, the bees are thinking of superseding, why not think about replacing that queen with one of these new queens that you've raised? This is particularly important in the end of the year. We often get to sort of August time and you might find that you've basically ended up with a colony that suddenly decided to supersede. Wouldn't it be nice to have some queens standing by that you knew are young? You can take the old queen and the risky supersedure that might not happen and just immediately drop a new queen in. Equally, everyone else will be having the same problem. So if you have too many queens at the end of the year, you can always find people to take them. I certainly know last year um, I raised a whole load of different queens um, and I had more than I needed. And I just put a shout out on the, the Ember Facebook group and lots and lots of people were having problems with queen supersedures and lots of happy people took queens. And hopefully those queens have all survived through the winter and have helped people carry on with colonies that otherwise might not have survived. And the final option is obviously if you've got too many colonies, and this sounds like a funny thing to say, but actually we get a lot of people, particularly beginners, asking, you know, I, I, they swarmed in the first year and now I've got two, and then they all swarmed and now I've got four, and then I've got eight and I've got 16, help, what do I do? And obviously we talk to people about merging and consolidating those colonies down back into single colonies at the end of the year and maybe keeping the better quality or the younger queen where necessary. But actually we talked earlier about making more bees and Spare colonies provide the raw materials for making more bees. I often end up having some colonies that I've brought through winter where they're not great colonies and I think I would like to requeen them at some point. Um, what I'll do with those colonies is I'll use them to break down to make lots of nukes or if they're building up strongly I can feed them, I can put extra boxes, brood boxes or supers on and get them to do all the wax work and get them to draw out comb, get them to tidy up, clean up boxes they're quite good to have as sort of support colonies for the colonies that you, you're more interested in. And then if they survive through the summer and they turn out to be decent enough queens, then great, you can keep them. If you're not that keen on them, then hopefully you've got other nukes or queens that you've raised that you can then replace them. So you're never at any point really worrying about merging down and, and disappearing colonies at the end of the year when you can actually do it earlier in the year and make up lots of different colonies that you can then requeen and sell on that might end up being better quality than if you just left them as a single colony and had to deal with them swarming and growing exponentially. So a little bit about selection. Selection is something that a lot of people are interested in, but most people think they can't really do. And obviously with selection, it's a lot easier to do selection if you've got more choice. So commercial beekeepers often end up having thousands of colonies to pick from. And with thousands of colonies, you can obviously always pick your, your perfect queen. But actually, even if you don't have a ton of colonies, you don't need very much to start making a difference to your own stocks. We talk about the different traits you can choose from. There's a big, massive long list. If you look at the, the Bibber website, they have a whole series of information on, on the different traits you might consider breeding for. Um, some of the commonest ones are things like temper, uh, thrift, which is you know not using a lot of stores, not eating too much, and overwintering well as a result. 
of kind of being thrifty and, and preserving and not needing too much feeding and, and molly coddling through the winter months. You've got spring buildup where the colonies come out of winter very strongly, build up quickly. They're not kind of weak and sickly. And obviously disease resistance. We're not looking for, for sick colonies, unhealthy colonies. We want the nice, healthy, strong colonies without obvious signs of disease um, to keep breeding from. Now, you might think it's quite hard to select for these traits, but actually we select for most of them automatically without thinking about it. So if you've got a very angry colony, that's not the colony that you're going to spend time trying to graft queen cells out of. You're not going to split it and make nukes out of it. You're not going to do anything with that queen other than try and replace her or replace that colony. If you've got a colony that eats too much food and is very lavish with its resources and needs feeding, it's more likely to starve through the winter, so it won't be the one you're breeding from in spring. If you've got a colony that isn't building up well, that's weak and sickly, diseased, isn't really doing very well, that's also not the one you're going to be breeding from in the spring. So these traits are quite easy to select for, um, and you don't need to do very much to just really be a little bit heavy handed on deciding which colonies you keep and don't. I know for many years when I first started keep, keeping bees, I was very kind of precious about my bees. And if I had five colonies where two of them were fantastic and three of them were terrible for some reason, I would really not want to do anything about the terrible ones because I felt really bad kind of replacing them. I felt like I should give them a chance. But over the years, I've kind of realized it doesn't really help anyone. It doesn't help the bees if they are not building up strongly, if they've got bad temper, because it means that I'm not inspecting them as often. And I'm not looking after them as well. And it doesn't help other beekeepers in the neighborhood because the drones from those poor quality colonies are then going out and mating with everyone else's and just bringing the whole standard down. So now when I find I have poor colonies, I try and do a little bit to try and replace them and just year by year improve things, improve rates that I'm looking at. The most important thing with traits, and this is a point at the end here, is don't try and select for honey production. It's the obvious thing that everyone thinks they want to select for, and actually it's more or less impossible to select for. There is a genetic predisposition to honey collection, but it's really hard to select for because there's so many variables involved in honey production that to try and deal with anything and figure out whether it's your bees that are doing well or whether it just happened to be a very good year for forage or the weather was nice or the weather was poor or you're in a good neighborhood, it's really impossible to know. So don't spend too much time worrying about honey production. Obviously, if you've, got a, if you've got a colony in your apiary that produces a ton of honey in a year when all the other colonies produce very little, or if you have a colony in your apiary that produces none when all your other colonies are ticking over and producing honey, you might weigh that up in your, in your selection. But overall, don't try and actively chase a honey-producing colony because all the environmental factors will just get in the way and you'll never really get anywhere. So in conclusion, there are a wide range of ways to get bees. And we've talked about everything from the very beginning getting your bees by just buying some or finding a swarm or putting out a bait hive and crossing fingers right through to much more complex things like queen rearing. And actually queen rearing isn't that difficult. The advanced techniques aren't the most difficult thing you might do is grafting and obviously we said you don't have to do that and everything else is just a question of, of timing and keeping an eye on your colonies and doing what you normally do with beekeeping just on a different level and a different scale. You can do a lot with a little you can go from a single colony up to many, many colonies in a year by doing lots of splits. So don't feel disheartened if you've come out of winter and you only have maybe one colony left and you think, oh, it's going to take me years to get back up to six. I better go and buy another four colonies. Think about what you can do with that one colony. Think about how many splits you can make. Think about maybe queen rearing, making multiple nukes. You can get quite far without having a lot of resource to start with. And don't be afraid to try new things. As I said before, if you're doing a split, Take an extra queen cell out, put it in a mating nuke, and see what happens. The worst you've got to lose is a cup full of bees that will just hang around. And if the queen doesn't survive, you can tip them out and they'll find their way back to the hive they were in originally. So try these things out, see what you can achieve, see where you end up. And most of all, just explore the different options for increasing your stock. And don't be afraid to, to try all these different things and see where you end up. So that's the end of my talk. Hopefully we've all reached the end, and hopefully I didn't get cut off halfway, you can all still hear me. If you have any specific questions about anything in the talk, uh, then my email address is there. Um, if you had any questions that come up during the talk, please by all means ask them in the chat window, and I'll do my best to answer them just now. Um, we can have uh, further discussions on the Facebook event after this is this uh, stream has closed down um, and obviously through the rest of the season anytime you've got any questions to ask the Facebook group's a really good place there's lots of experienced beekeepers on there lots of people who often can offer good advice to you 
So feel free to keep using those resources. So I'll just jump over to the chat window just now and see if there's any questions coming in. Nothing just at the moment. Oh, lots of chat through the through the talk. Just having a look. Good. It looks like people didn't get cut off. That's the main thing. I can see there that um, Stephen's mentioned my Swarm poll device. Um, I'll just quickly jump back to that slide anyone who may have seen that go past and was wondering what exactly was going on in that picture. So this is something that I basically cobbled together a few years ago and has been immensely useful. It's a telescopic painter's pole. Um, on the end of it is a plastic jug, one of the ones you get off an office water cooler with the bottom cut off. Um, and it's basically just glued onto the end of the pole. And the idea is that quite often you get swarms in trees. Uh, this allows you to basically hook underneath the branch and you just tap onto the branch and the usually drops almost entirely into the cup of the, the jug. And because it's shiny plastic, they can't get a good grip, so they tend to stay in the bottom. And then you can tip it out onto a sheet, put a box over the top of them and collect them. So I made one a few years ago, used it quite a lot, and I've shown it to lots of people. And I believe there's a collection of them started off around the, around the society. I think Stephen has probably made one. And I know, I think Carrie has one as well. So. It's good to see. Thanks, thanks for all the, the comments, everyone. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, the talk should be permanently on YouTube. I believe it'll be at the same link, but if not, we'll we'll send an email out with the new link. Um, and I think we can also edit it, so I'll cut off the half an hour at the beginning with the metronome, so that anyone who wants to watch it a second time doesn't have to sit through half an hour of ticking. See, everyone's being quiet. I don't know if that's because people can't find the chat box or if, if it was an excellent talk and everyone got their questions answered or if people are just being shy. So if you think of any questions afterwards, feel free to post them in the, the Facebook group. Um, And equally, if you have any feedback from the actual presentation itself, if you had any particular technical problems, if you think there's anything that could be done differently, um, we obviously don't know how long um, these kind of lockdown situation is going to carry on for. So it would be good if we can, if we need to do these things again to get any feedback on how it's gone and how people have found it. Um, speak to other associations as well and see how they've been experiencing it and see how they've got on with it. Oh, there's a question from, from Alistair there. Do I have any preference for style of Nukebox? Oh, and there's a question from Gillian as well. I'll answer Alistair's and then I'll come back to Gillian's. I've just read them in the wrong order. Um, so my preference actually at the moment, um, these things seem to change all the time, is I use the um, poly nuke boxes which Mazemore make. Um, there are a variety of different styles of uh, Mazemore nukes, oh, sorry, of, of poly nukes. Um, and I find that they're really good. For one thing, they take six frames, uh, which actually buys you a bit of a bit of leeway because you can use five frames and a dummy board, um, but you can also um, come back later and add a sixth frame. So if you've got a nuke that's building up and looks like it's getting a bit too strong, but you haven't quite found anyone to buy it yet, or you haven't quite got another hive to put it in. Uh, they have a built-in feeder, which goes on the top, which is really easy for putting stores and uh, extra food in. Um, and they have a nice entrance reducer wheel on the front that goes from being completely closed with ventilation only to queen excluder to fully open. So for transporting bees, they work really well and they have an open mesh floor as well. The only downside is I've occasionally used them for collecting swarms and with the open mesh floor, the swarms get really confused um, about whether or not they should go in through the door or underneath through the mesh. Um, but other than that, I've used them quite a lot I previously had lots of problems taking wooden hives through winter, or wooden nukes through winter rather, with having to feed them extra and try and insulate them, but the polynukes seem to work surprisingly well. 
So that would be my recommendation. There's another style, I can't remember who makes it, maybe Pains, which has a built-in sort of side feeder, which goes along one side. Um, they're also very good in terms of insulation and keeping the bees going, but I find the side feeder space is really hard to clean. And also, if you put liquid in it, often um, you often end up getting bees kind of drowning in it and stuff. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a challenge that way. So the next question is from Gillian. Gillian was asking, which is the easier, an artificial swarm or Ben Harden? I don't know, actually. Um, obviously, an artificial swarm, you have to really do. So Ben Harden is there if you have a colony that isn't swarming and you want to make them make queen cells. Um, by putting the, the frame with the vertical hanging cups with eggs in or with larvae in, um, they, will, um, they will draw queen cells out. If a colony is already planning to swarm, then you do have to separate them in some way. Um, but a Ben Harden method is probably about as difficult as an artificial swarm in terms of what you're doing, because you're really just manipulating boxes. Um, and then the only other thing you need to do is come back and check on them to make sure you get to them, see how many queen cells they've got, and then use, have a plan to use those queen cells. So a lot of this is about um, timing of things. Obviously, you don't want to be in a situation where you, you're, you've got a whole load of um, you've got a queen who's laid a load of eggs, which are ready to graft when they're larvae, but you haven't got any colony to put the frame in. And equally, you don't want a frame full of capped queen cells ready to go into nukes if you haven't got any nukes ready. So a lot of it's about timing, but it's easy to sort of work these things out. And there's quite a few resources online. Um, again, I think Bibber, it is has a, a spreadsheet and it's a it's a queen timing calendar. Um, oh, sorry, just seeing Sarah there. Um, it's the Maysmore Poly Nukes is my favorite uh, poly nuke model, um, also available from Simon the Beekeeper, I think, at one point. Um, so yes, so um, Ben Harden, if you are raising queens, artificial swarm if you have a colony that's actively wanting to swarm, and in both cases, timing is the important thing. Have a schedule and, and plan in advance and work backwards from where you want to be and figure out when you need to start. Uh, next question, uh, Chloe is saying, if you put a bait hive, if you put a bait hive out, do you have any warning before a swarm moves in, and should you ask locally if it belongs to anyone? Uh, so the first question, the warning, yes, you get actually quite a a, a good amount of warning. Um, so the scout bees will start scouting um, up to seven to ten days before a swarm actually happens. You'll see a few bees coming in and out, and unlike um, normal kind of bees investigating a box like robbers, they, they spend quite a lot of time there. They go inside, they come outside, they fly around the door, and you kind of see it happen. Um, and then the number of scouts gradually increases until eventually you end up with anywhere between 20 and 40 scouts. And that's the critical mass. Once you're seeing 20 to 40 scouts, you, you get a slight lull. They normally, for about half an hour to an hour, they all go home to the, to the swarm that's probably by this point hanging in a tree confirm their decision and then they arrive. So you expect over a number of days to see it going from like one to two bees, five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, then a gap, and then suddenly the swarm arrives. Uh, it's quite fascinating to watch the process when it happens. The downside is sometimes you get the gap and then they never arrive and that's because a beekeeper managed to get to them just in time before they left their apiary. In terms of asking if it belongs to anyone, um, there's no kind of legal requirement. There's, there's, it's a purely sort of moral one, I guess. If you if you know there's a bee, beekeeper near to you that you know has said, oh, I, you know, I'm really unwell at the moment and I can't get to my bees and I know they're going to swarm. Could anyone keep an eye out? Then you might think, oh, I caught the, probably their swarm. I better give it back again. But equally, if there's a beekeeper up the road who you know is not very good at looking after their bees and doesn't really take good care of them, then you know you're, you're more than welcome, more than entitled to keep them. The, yeah, the, as, as Stephen says, in the in the law, if you catch a swarm, they are your bees, um, providing you didn't break into somebody else's hive to, to catch them. Um, and Chloe, second question, if I do an artificial swarm and I'm, a, I'm unable to move the hive to the other side after seven days, does it matter? So this is the head and idea of moving the colony from one side to the other. The idea is that it gives the original colony a bit of a boost because the the bees in there are all flying bees and they're only getting older. So by moving that first colony, some bee, some new flying bees that have grown up from nurse bees will drift into it. In reality, I'm not sure it makes a huge difference. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it um, if you haven't got um, if you haven't got access to do that. Um, 
because obviously moving a full hive can be can be quite a tricky operation if they're quite heavy. Um, so a lot of people do it, but I'm I'm not entirely convinced it makes a massive difference. Um, if you were worried, once the colonies were settled, you could always just move a frame of capped brood across, and that would have the same effect. You'd get a whole load of new nurse bees appearing in the colony and, and boosting the numbers. Um, oh, Sarah's asking, any tips for treating Varroa in a, in a maize more nuke? Um, so obviously if you're using uh, vaporization or sublimation, you have to be careful because of the, the hot metal. Um, the maize more nukes have a mesh floor, so you can, if you're careful, vaporize from underneath. Um, otherwise, uh, oxalic acid trickle uh, would be an obvious um, treatment in the nukes because the oxalic acid trickle shouldn't affect the, the polystyrene. Um, otherwise, if you're using any of the um, mitocides, any of the strips, they usually give um, a nucleus or a small colony dose. So a lot of them, it'll be a, a single strip rather than two strips or a, a single pot of um, thymol ointment or whatever the equivalent is for the product. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. But yes, if you've got polystyrene hives, you have to be slightly more careful about things like uh, vaporization. And also, obviously, you can't scorch them to clean them. You have to use um, bleach and soda crystals instead to wash them. It's great to get questions coming in. I'm happy to answer any more that people have about this talk or anything in general. I'm always happy to answer the beekeeping questions. I can see just, just an announcement there from Steve. And if anyone finds any black or black and yellow bees, they're his. Um, so um, just to keep an eye out for those. I'll let you negotiate with him what the finder's fee is. Uh, it's a good question there from, from Archie Byrne saying, I'm hoping to avoid making any increases. What methods can you recommend? Yes, actually, that's something I didn't mention at the end. I talked about how to get how to deal with bees that you already got, but I didn't mention what to do if you now have too many bees or if, if you don't want to increase in the first place. Um, my preferred method for kind of staying the same is usually to use the Demaray method of swarming. So in the Demaray method, you start with your single brood box you put a queen excluder and supers on top as, as you would normally. Um, and then what you do is you take the original brood box, replace it with a, an empty box with drawn comb, put the queen in and move the original box on top of the supers. So you now have a stack which is brood box with foundation, queen excluder, supers, second queen excluder and the original box. Because of the gap between the boxes, the bees in the top box won't really smell the queen anymore and they'll see themselves as queenless and they'll start raising queen cells. If you destroy those queen cells and come back and check a couple of times and keep destroying those queen cells, eventually they won't have any young brood to build more queen cells out of. The swarming instinct will sort of disappear. The bees that emerge will gradually move downstairs and they'll, they'll rejoin the queen downstairs and become flying bees and slowly but surely the top box will empty. When the top box is completely empty, basically it'll only have stores left in it, there won't be any more brood, all the bees will basically leave it and they'll probably just start using it as a super. You can either take it away um, and then store it, or if it's got old frames, you could you know, recycle them or burn them or whatever. Um, or if you've got a colony that happens to be very swarmy and they're looking to make swarm preparations in the bottom box again, you can just repeat the process, swap them round, put the empty drawn comb in the bottom box with the queen and move the box, the, the new box as it was that's now full of brood back up to the top and you can cycle round and round. Um, there's quite a good video on YouTube of the Demaray process um, and that will um, basically let you um, kind of get, get your head around it. But Demaray is good because you, you don't need to do any increase and at the end of the season you, you've got the same queen and the same bees. Um, obviously, there's only a nut, so many years you can do that for before you end up with the um, the problem where you you have too many um, too many colonies. But um, Demaray is a good option for that. I've just uh, Stephen's just asked me to put the Pagden slide back up again just to to remind people of the the different processes. So so Demaray is kind of if you imagine Pagden is side by side, Demaray is one on top of the other, but with queen excluders instead of a solid floor, so that the bees can keep moving from one side to the other and keep interacting. Hopefully that answers your question.
So I think that might be more or less the point to, to wrap things up. Hopefully everyone's in, enjoyed the talk and it's been it's been useful and entertaining for people. It's been quite an interesting experience for me. I'm obviously I'm to me I'm just talking to my computer, so it's been good to have the chat here to just confirm that people are actually listening and <laughs> my talk has been heard. I was always slightly worried that actually you know people might not actually be there at all. Um so yes, the talk will be will be on the YouTube channel and hopefully people will um be able to go back and watch it again. So as people have said, there's quite a lot of information there, so you can watch it more than once if you need to. And I will basically wrap up here. The Facebook event is another place to keep asking questions and you can obviously ask any questions through the rest of the season on the Facebook group. So hopefully I will speak to you all in